Hello and welcome to Huntington Stadium. The Knights quest for promotion is going well thus far as some of the contenders start to fall by the wayside. So we're back again for edition 6 of Inside the Knights. The slump in form many people predicted after the defeat against Workington didn't materialise. As the Knights swept aside Keithley Cougars here at Huntington Stadium and then put in a tremendous team performance away at Swinton in the searing heat. First on today's show I've come to speak to a guy that crossed the whitewash twice in that victory in Greater Manchester, Matt Blameyer. 23 year old Matt Blameyer is well known to supporters having played for the club in its inaugural season. In between his two spells at the Knights, Matt went to ply his trade in Australia for Coogee Dolphins, where he reached a grand final. Matt has something to prove this season, after his last spell was blighted by injury, making only four appearances in 2003, and his eight tries in 17 games this season so far is an illustration of his undoubted ability. Matt, let's talk about recent results, and you must have been really pleased with the great team performance to beat Swinton. Yes, it was a good game, we knew it was going to be a big game for us, um, and we really pleased to come away with the two points in such an important game, as you said. Were they as strong a side as you expected? Um, every team's a strong side, you know, you can't really go into a game expecting someone's going to be a weak side. Um, but as I said, we knew it was going to be a tough game, and it definitely was, especially with the heat. Um, but yeah, really pleased with the result. Nice to get revenge after they turned us over oh, here. Yeah, yeah, really good. Um, we were a better side, I think, with them earlier in the season. We are a better side now, and I think we knew if we turned upon the dates, we'd, we'd uh, get the right result, and we did. And you must also have been well pleased to get two crucial first half tries. Yeah, it's always pleasing to get a couple of tries. Um, more, so, more so the second one, because uh, we've been under pressure for such a long period of the game. And to come over that try just before, second, just before the end of the first half was, was really good. Now, I went to the game and was struggling with the conditions on the terrace just watching. So playing, I mean, how did you manage to cope with it? Yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty hot sometimes. Uh, that, that first half hit, I couldn't come quick enough. Um, I think there's one stage in the game where they had like four or five sets on us back to back. Um, I don't know, you just, you just do what you've got to do, I guess. Nothing you can do. And we're taking plenty of water on board. Oh, heaps of water, yeah. yeah. Um, we were taking some more stuff as well, the colony bringing on some uh, energy replacement stuff as well, which was uh, pretty important, helped us out in the long run. Previous game at home to Keithley, another good win. First half, though, was a bit patchy, and but the second half was a fantastic performance. Yeah. So how can you explain that kind of first half being a bit lacklustre, second half absolutely blistering stuff? <laughs> I don't really know, to tell you the truth. I mean, sometimes it's, I guess it's just good just to sit down and analyse what's happening in the first half and let Cookie and the, and the guys have a chat with us, calm us down. Um, then we come out and obviously did the business. You played for the Knights in our first season, then you went off to Australia to play for Coogee Dolphins. Do you think that experience in Australia has made you a better player? Oh yeah, big time. Because um, my first season at York was, was obviously hampered a little bit by injury. I had an injury in my hand and an injury in my knee. And I think it was good just to get away and clear my head. Um, and obviously going away and playing in Australia hasn't done me any harm. And, and I really enjoyed the experience. Earlier in the series we asked Chris Levy to compare Australian Rugby League and English Rugby League. Mm. What are your thoughts on the difference between the two? Um, I think a lot of it's to do with the heat, like you just said. Um, over there, it, it was like that every week against Swinton over there, and, and you get used to it. But I think over there, a lot of their players are a lot more patient. They don't necessarily care if they win a game 1 0 or 100 0, as long as they get the win. And that's a big thing. But um, we're not too far behind. We're not, we're not too far behind. And how do they take to you as an Englishman? <laughs> yeah, look, yeah. The, uh, the, the, the usual nicknames come out, but um, yeah, they're a really good set of lads and they, they made me feel at home and I can't wait to hopefully go back there someday and, and say hello to them all. And how pleased were you to come back to the Knights after that? Yeah, very pleased. Um, obviously, I've had a good experience in the Knights in my first year and uh, when I came back and I was looking for a club, uh, I was very keen to come back to the Knights because I knew a lot of the guys and um, everything just worked out okay. So it's been a long season. Do you feel tired, or do you feel still ready for action? I still feel ready for action. I mean, it has been a long season, but it's been well documented recently about the weeks off that we're having, like a week on, week off, and um, it does you good to rest your aches and pains. But um, yeah, ready to go to kick on and hopefully finish the job for the last few games. Finally, do you think it's true what people say that it's now a two-horse race in NL2 between us and Dewsbury? Oh, you, you don't really pay attention to stuff like that as a player. You, you just get on with what you've got to do each week. You just turn up and 
do what you've got to do and then hopefully the rest will take care of itself. Well, we're looking forward to seeing you in action for the rest of the season. Thanks very much, Cheers, mate. mate. You may remember in the last edition of our programme, we looked at the work of the Knights Scholarship Scheme. Last Sunday, York Acorn Amateur Rugby League Club kindly organised a fundraising event for the Scholarship Scheme. And while I was down there enjoying the event, I managed to catch up with former Acorn player and one of the stars of the Knights squad this season, John Liddell. Former Leeds Academy and York Acorn player John Liddell is 23 years old and joined the club in the close season from near rivals Hunslet Hawks. York-born John has a family connection as his cousin Peter Fox also plays for the Knights. A very versatile player, he has played at hooker, loose forward, standoff and fullback and scored two vital tries in the win at Swinton in round 11. So John, we're down here at York Acorn today. You're a former Acorn player. What was it like playing down here? Oh, it was fantastic. I mean, um, obviously got a lot of family and friends down here. Um, I remember actually building this place about 10, 10, 11 years ago and it sort of carried that family theme through. Um, Great junior set up, just a great place to play rugby, yeah. So now you're playing for the Knights, how important is it like, that clubs like this are prospering in York? Well, I think it's, it's, it's good that they prosper. I mean, obviously, it's, I think there's about sort of eight York-based players in the Knights squad now, which is good for, for York Rugby League. And there's a lot more coming through, not just at sort of York Acorn, but All Blacks and, and Hewith as well. So it's good. You mentioned about the York-based players and you came from Hunslet. Is that your dream move, to come to play for your hometown club? Yeah, definitely. Um, I went to Hunslet, obviously, after I, I finished there at Leeds, um, which was a good place, um, good place to, uh, to sort of play rugby. But, um, you know, when the opportunity arose to come and, and join York, it was, uh, it was too good to refuse. You know, the, obviously, the, I know a lot of my mates were down there as well, and uh, the travelling was getting a bit of a burden. But, I mean, it, it's a fantastic club and it's, it's going places, so I wanted to sort of be part of that and, uh, and jump on the bandwagon a bit. Uh, I think I've, I had quite a few bad moments in, um, I think it was season... Uh, I think it was something like 2001, the, the last wasp, wasp season when uh, we went through a season where we, we, we did, the York lads would get picked up, up on the coach from the stadium and then we'd, be, we'd travel through to Castleford and uh, with under league cooks and a whole load of new players would get on the bus and we didn't even know who they were and uh, we'd then go from there and usually go and get hammered somewhere and then um, as we all know it all sort of went downhill and we, the club ended up folding and uh, that season was a terrible season. And then obviously, um, well, I mean, I've never really sort of won anything, any finals like some of these lads have, but um, just to run out with the, that shirt on for the, uh, the first Knights game that we played against Old Kingston Rovers in, in front of such a big crowd at the Huntington Stadium was probably uh, the high, well, it was one of the highlights of my career. How are things going for you this season? Yeah, I think they're going quite well. Um, from a personal point of view, yeah. Um, I had a bit of a setback. I got injured, um, had a compound dislocation of my finger, which set me back a bit, but um, I've been reasonably pleased with my form. I've sort of tried to fill in. I mean, I'm, I am a utility player, but Mick, Mick knows that, you know, I, I, can, I can do sort of play various positions, and I've just tried to be consistent, and I've, I've been relatively pleased. So, yeah. The two tries against Keithley, that must have been, uh, obviously, with being a tough game, I must be pretty happy with that. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I don't, I don't score too many, um, so to get two tries against Keithley was really good, especially the second one. Um, probably a bit fluky. I just seemed to carry on running, and, and their defenders were sort of moving out of the way, so it just sort of opened up. But um, yeah, it's good to get a couple of tries and, uh, and get a good win. So that was a good, good. Uh, it was a good win, was that one? For me, it'd have to be uh, Keith Senior. Uh, his ability to offload and put his winger away is just outstanding. Um, I mean, um, are you happy with that, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is not having a dig at Dan. I mean, me, me and Dan have got this uh, connection. Oh, yeah. uh, well, the curtain could be drawn, you know, Peter. We can always draw the curtain if you want to. That's a wonderful Friday night. Now, this time last year, after we lost to Workington, we had a bit of a slump. We've managed not to do that this time. Was that in the minds of the players at all, what happened last year? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, from a personal point of view, I mean, I wasn't here last year, but uh, keeping an eye on results, I saw that, you know, it was, a, it was a general slump, but we did talk about it, um, you know, that we were going to get straight back on the boat, back to winning ways, and just sort of forget about Workington. You know, we, we sort of got a motto in training where we sort of, 
Mick always says that you know we're going we're gonna to forget about what happened last week and concentrate on, on what goes on this week. So that's what we did. Prepared well for both games and um, come up with two good, two good uh, results and four points. So you've not got a game today, and obviously that's why we're down here. Is that an advantage coming into the next game against Gateshead, or do you get a kind of a bit annoyed with having weeks off? Um, I think it just depends sometimes. I mean, sometimes we, we've come back and um, not performed very well after we've had a week off, but I mean, it's exactly the same for Gateshead, so there can't be any complaints. It's just, um, you know, we've got to, just got to prepare this week um, for, for a big game against Gateshead, really. And it will be a big game. Gateshead used to be the whipping boys of the division, but Dean Thomas has got them sorted out. Narrow win when we played them at their place, so it's going to be pretty hard. Well, I think it will be tough. Um, you know, they showed with the result last week. I think they beat Workington. Uh, they're a very good outfit. They're, they're a big set of lads as well, and, and they can throw a lot of offloads out. So it's important that we handle that um, and, and just stick to our own game plan and uh, hopefully come away with the two points. Still a long way to go in the league season campaign. It's Dewsbury away after Gateshead. Do you think if we win at Dewsbury, we've more or less done it? No, I don't think so. Um, you know, you can't really, uh, until it's done and dusted, you can't really say that. I mean, obviously, Dewsbury is a massive game for us. It, 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 it gives us a massive advantage if we went there and got two points. But such is the, the, the competition in the league. You know, you, you, your lower teams, or your supposed lower teams, can turn over the big boys. So you've got, you've got to be on your guard every game. But, I mean, for sure, if we go, go there and get two points, it will be a massive victory for us. Finally, John, obviously we know that your cousin is Peter Fox. Is there any rivalry there in the family? Uh, there is a bit, yeah. Um, not, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean uh, when it comes to drives, I'm obviously never going to touch him. But, um, yeah, there's a bit of rivalry. We sort of grew up together. Um, I used to beat him up a bit and that, I think. So, uh, <laughs> you know, there is a bit of rivalry there. But, I mean, we sort of rub off each other. We, we train together quite a bit in the gym and that. And, um, you know, it's sort of healthy competition, I suppose, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so... <laughs> OK, well, let's hope that rivalry continues in a positive way on the field. Keep up the good work and thanks for talking to us. Yeah, thank you very much, yeah. Cheers. The Jerk and Bird connection. Who's hold and what's the history behind that? <laughs> Jerk and Bird, come on, Al. I can never say where the bird comes from because Fox is the thickest line I've ever met in my life. <laughs> I went to Manchester for Mick Ramsden's stag do and uh, on the way there I was in the car with Foxy and uh, Jason Ranshaw. Jason asked Foxy to read the directions and it was like this uh, follow the M602 then take the A57 head towards the Gumex centre <laughs> then turn left before the main arena we definitely know where that comes from. And the jerk comes from Johnny just being a f dick and. Uh, well, he's a big one. That's it, there's TV cameras in. <laughs>
As usual on our programme, let's round up the latest goings on in National League 2 and look at the current state of play for the Knights at this point in the season. In round 10 of the Championship, you've just seen the Knights beat Keithley Cougars 44 points to 16, putting to bed any repeat of last season's dip in form. And what a way to do it, with a blistering display of fast-flowing rugby in the second half, and of course that spectacular 63rd minute try scored by John Liddell after a great bit of skill and awareness from captain Chris Levy. In other matches, Workington won a bad-tempered encounter with Swinton 23 points to 20, Sheffield Eagles won the basement battle at Bloomfield Road, and Hunslet won away in London 22-4, a brace of tries from prop Nick Stavely. There were only four games in round 11 as the game between Sheffield Eagles and London Scholars has been scheduled for later in the season on Monday the 29th of August. But what a round it was, a great advert for National League 2. There was high drama at the Thunderdome, where Gateshead did the Knights a huge favour by turning over in-form Workington Town by a single point in a thrilling encounter. An on-loan Knights star Neil Thorman weighed in with a 34th minute try that helped put a serious dent in Town's hopes of glory. In South Leeds, Dewsbury won a potentially tricky derby match at Hunslet, 40 points to 14. The Rams were helped by the dismissal of the Hawks' standoff David Gibbons on 35 minutes, with ex-Castleford player Darren Rogers helping himself to a hat-trick. What about the Knights? The away game at Swinton was billed as a massive game, and the Knights lived up to all expectations with a fantastic defensive performance in the first half, followed by incisive attacking in the second to sweep aside a difficult opponent. Two tries from Matt Blameyer and one apiece from Jim Elston, Peter Fox and Chris Ross gave the Knights the game, played in very difficult conditions. A gutsy display from the team, the like of which we'll need to see again should the National League 2 crown be coming to North Yorkshire. And the entertainment for Knights fans doesn't stop there. In round 12, the Knights faced a tough physical gate, said Thunderside, and it wasn't a spectacle for the faint of heart. After throwing away a seemingly unassailable 36-12 lead, scrum half and ex-Thunder star Paul Thorman popped up to put over a match-winning drop goal only three minutes from time to seal a very uneasy victory. Two points were gained from the match, and that's what counts, but coach Mick Cook will have some thinking to do about how the Knights' defence could concede that many points at home. In other games, there were wins for the Lions and the Hawks. London piled on the misery for the Cougars with a narrow win, 15 points to 12, and in the other big game of the day, a late one-pointer saved a point for Dewsbury away at Workington. After three more wins for the Knights, the NL2 league table top half is looking very healthy at this stage of the season, as Swinton and Workington appear to have dropped out of the running, and it looks like a two-horse race between the York City Knights and the Dewsbury Rams. The next game in round 13 is the Rams versus the Knights, in what could be a decisive afternoon in the season. At the bottom, Keithley will be disappointed with their campaign to date and the Blackpool Panthers are now outright wooden spooners after the Scholars' victory over the Cougars. Peter Fox is still out in front in the table of leading try scorers with 20 tries from 20 games and one short of Chris Langley's club record of 21 tries in a season. Then it's Dan Potter with 10, Neil Law with 9 and Matt Blameyer comes into the picture joining Chris Levy on 8. Here are the forthcoming fixtures for the York City Knights, and as already mentioned, the next one is the big one, Dewsbury Rams away. A large following is expected from York for what is the biggest game for the club since the final at Widnes last season. After that, on August the 7th, it's a trip to Bloomfield Road to face bottom club Blackpool Panthers. Let's hope the atmosphere can match that of the Northern Rail Cup final played at the seaside town a couple of weeks ago. Then, on the 14th of August, it's Ladies' Day, with the visit of London Scholars. It's often said that one of the advantages the York City Knights have over their rivals is that they're the fittest team in National League 2. Fitness could be the key to success this season, and so I've come to speak to the man responsible for the Knights' fitness levels, conditioner Colin Sanctuary. A qualified and experienced fitness trainer, Colin Sanctuary has been an integral part of training sessions under all three Knights coaches since the club's inception. Having also worked with Durham County Cricket Club, Colin's contribution has been vital to match skill with physical fitness in what is a very long, arduous season for the players. 
So Colin, your job title is conditioner. What does that mean? Conditioner? Um, quite a broad brush really. Um, at the nights, uh, it's probably a bit different with it being part-time. Uh, time's limited, so the, the scope we get with the players, it, it, it's just not quite the same. The job mainly entails making sure the guys are physically prepared for the games. Um, any sort of rehab that needs to be done, uh, linking in with the physio, is uh, taken care of. Uh, and those are the two uh, main strands, really. And how long have you worked as a fitness trainer? Um, in the, the conditioning area, I've been, I've been involved for five years now. And so you've been at the night since the start. You've worked with three quality coaches. Does that make your job much easier? Uh, definitely, yeah. Uh, it's, just, it's like any job, isn't it? When you work with people, um, you're learning all the time. And over the last three years, it's been great because you've, you've, you've had so much experience from uh, Paul Broadbent through to Richie Agar last year. And again, Mick Cook. I mean, they've all played at the highest level. They've all been involved with Super League clubs. They know what's required. Um, so it's really, the more you learn from them as individuals, you take on to your next coach, it just becomes so much easier. Now, is your workload lighter this season because we have, um, we've had had four coaches working at the same time? Um, no, not at all. Um, the way that Mick's worked, it's been very good. We've sort of worked as more of a, as a team, um, as opposed to last year when it was very much, I suppose, Richard and myself, and that was it. Um, this year it's been more of a team effort, um, but that's been all engineered by Mick and, and overseen and you know, the workload's just the same, uh, but you just get some even better input from the likes of you know, Jason Ramshaw and, and Daryl Powell, so it's, and Beans, it's, it's great. Pundits say that we're the fittest team in National League 2 this season. Is that, how, do you take that as a big compliment? Um, personally, I don't, but I think the players should, because at the end of the day, it's those guys that do all the work. Um, and also, linking to, to Mick, um, you can only do what Mick sometimes will allow you to do. And if that relationship works well from the conditioning to the playing side, I think that's when you start seeing the benefits. Now, I think that this year is one of the things we've got right. I think Mick and myself, well, I think we've got a reasonable working relationship um, then linking with, with obviously with Jason, Beans and, uh, and Daryl. Uh, we seem to work well as a team. And the last game away at Swinton, it was very, very hot. Yeah. What steps were taken to look after the players' well-being? Because it must have been quite dangerous if, if you're not properly prepared. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think prior to the game, I think just the general fitness levels of the guys, I and mean, that, that's down to them, not down to the work that you know, we give them to do. It's the effort they put in, that helps them. Um, they've gone to the game, they've stuck to the game plan, so that's made it a little bit easier for them. Um, but from sort of a, I suppose, a nutritional point of view, uh, we've made sure that there was plenty of fluids on board as we travelled across. Um, and then more importantly on the game, it, it's making sure that they keep reasonably well hydrated throughout the game. Obviously that's dictated by how many times you can get on the pitch and to who you can get to. Um, but we also try to make sure that, that you, can, you can mix up solutions such as electrolyte solutions which help put back into the body all the... Um, when you're sweating you lose the, sort of the sodiums and potassiums and that's what we look to get back in there that helps the muscles contract and that's hopefully um, what we were aiming to do and you know, at half time you get a chance to get into everyone then as well as cooling them down uh, with some, some of the cool towels and so forth and they were the main strategies hydration at the start, making sure during the game we got these electrolytes on board when we could to the guys and then cool them down again at half time just making sure that process keeps going and going and going. Summer rugby is a great idea to get more fans through the turnstiles yeah. but surely for someone in your job it, it presents a lot of serious challenges compared to winter rugby? Um, not really because at the end of the day you don't be training your pre-season this summer so it's sort of swings and roundabouts so there's, it's just the same really. Now this level of rugby league obviously we are heralded as the fittest but we're also top of the league because we're probably the best team. Yeah. What do you think is, is the balance between fitness and skill at this level? I mean, at the end of the day, these guys are they're just very good rugby players. You know, you've got the likes of Lee Jackson, Neil Law, who've all played Super League and, great, and for Great Britain. And you've got the likes of those individuals floating on the league. Um, you guys have all played not in, was it National League One as well. They're all very similar in skill levels. So you're looking for the extra areas where you can sort of push them all and develop them. Um, I mean, it's, you know, if, if fitness is one of the areas that we've, we've got a little bit right this year, that's great. Uh, hopefully it gives those guys the edge when they're on the pitch, so it's the support players there, they can work for each other, they can push up, all things that Mix, Mix talks about, then hopefully come to fruition. I managed to catch you before training tonight, we're obviously in the, now the last third of the season, the business yeah. then. How does your training method change from obviously this stage of the season, yeah. when maybe they're a bit tired, to the beginning? It's difficult, it is, because you're very conscious of the state the guys are in, how tired they are, how fatigued they are, um, and it is a bit of a balancing act. You've, there's no books that will talk you through, there's all the theories in the world that are out there, but at the end of the day, it's got to come down to some form of professional judgement um, and linking in with the likes of you know, Wikuki and his thoughts as well. 
So at the start of the year, probably the workload is a little bit heavier. Uh, we try and drop it off as it comes into the season, um, and we, we really make sure that we any areas that have sort of looked that we need to work on from the previous week, I don't know, be it something in the contact and the line speed, whatever it may be, we look to address in the session. Um, so we really try and make sure everything we do is really specific to the game plan that we've got in place for next week, but also linking into what we've, we've just gone through as well. Lastly, Colin, after promotion, which fingers crossed we'll get this season, will your methods change when we're challenging more difficult sides or will you keep the same kind of uh, philosophy? The theory is the same, doesn't matter where you are, the theory is exactly the same. Um, if, the, you know, if the guys were full time, that would be fantastic and that's where you get the benefits. You can't uh, pack any more into what they'd get already. I think, too fair to them, they seem to, compared to other sides, get a, get a pretty, uh, pretty fair crack of the whip. Well, thanks very much for your time, Colin. It sounds very interesting. Thank you. OK, thanks, now. Thanks to Colin, one of the unsung heroes working hard behind the scenes and making a big contribution to the success of the team on the field. That's all for this, the sixth edition of Inside the Knights. Thanks for watching, and let's hope we're talking about more victories and more success next time. Bye-bye.